So hello everyone, uh, my name is Jakub Binski and I'm a software developer at ING Group. Uh, today I will do my best uh, to show you an in-depth analysis of using Flutter in the enterprise environment. Uh, I think it's quite an interesting topic, um, but before we move into the Flutter, uh, it's a good idea to give you a story behind uh, choosing Flutter and why decisions, decisions like this are not uh, easy in the enterprise world. But before that, a little bit about ING Group. Um, ING is uh, one of the largest bank in Poland. Uh, it's uh, from Netherlands, to be precise. It provides banking, insurance, asset management services, and it plays, it's placed uh, in over 50 countries. You might say, great man, but why should I care? <laughs> Uh, it is connected with uh, the whole topic, so I think it's worth discussing how big is ING Group and uh, uh, how big enterprise it is. Uh, because uh, we had old application uh, before we start developing our new application. Uh, it was a native application written for both uh, Android and iOS, <laughs> and it wasn't the best application. <laughs> Uh, people didn't like it, and uh, I mean it that they didn't like it. <laughs> on Google Play, we scored uh, on the old application 2.2 out of 5, <laughs> which means it was a terrible application uh, for some people. Uh, and on App Store, we scored 4 out of 5, on five, five on, or from 1 to 5 scale. Uh, you might ask, how is it even possible that you scored so differently on uh, different platforms? Uh, and it is possible because uh, we didn't have that much in common with those uh, two applications. Uh, of course, besides backend, backend that uh, is behind those applications. Uh, those applications were written uh, with different languages, different technologies, with different approaches, and with, by different people. <laughs> As you can probably see on your screen now uh, in my presentation, uh, those applications look completely different, and uh, this is the same screen. <laughs> this is the dashboard screen or uh, home screen uh, with the user menu, and it doesn't have too much in common. <laughs> and you might ask, what's the big deal if it looks different? Uh, it's a big problem with maintaining up to applications that look completely different and have completely different uh, code behind it because bugs that are, for example, present on Android are not present on, on iPhones, and bugs that are present on iPhones are not present on Android phones. Uh, the problem gets even bigger if you take into consideration that what I said before on the previous slide. Uh, ING is one of the biggest banks in Poland, <laughs> and that means we have got a lot of production tickets every day. So we have to spend a lot of our time maintaining and fixing those bugs, those bugs and not making new features. Uh, so that was a big problem for us. <clears throat> and uh, when I said we have to maintain it, uh, there's a small problem <laughs> with maintaining that those applications were poorly written, I should say. Uh, it had got a lot of legacy code. First of all, it was written in Objective-C, in old Objective-C because we, uh, it was old application. Uh, on the iOS, uh, it was uh, on Android. It was uh, in old Java. Uh, we have got internal libraries that were really poorly written. Uh, documentation was poorly written, so we had to deal with the code that was not the best documented. So we spent a lot of time figuring out how it, everything works, and also that application was. Uh, maintained for a lot of time. What does it mean? It means that we have to, uh, we had to manage uh, different code conventions because because some people came to the this project, some people leave this project. And you know how it works if something uh, takes years. Uh, so there was a, a lot of spaghetti code, mm, and that was a big problem mm, because we had to spend a lot of time and time is money for developers, and uh, people in man management knew that. So uh, they, so they uh, talked with uh, developers, 
uh, and we thought that we have to make a new application that solve our problem with maintaining and to fix the score on Google Play. <clears throat> That's how our application uh, looks like behind <laughs> uh, the, in the source code. Okay, but uh, uh, we didn't want to make a new application that is as bad as old one. <laughs> so we had to choose a good technology stack. Uh, so we spent a lot of ta our time, our development time uh, in early stage on proof of concept applications uh, in many different technologies. Uh, as you can imagine, choosing technology is not as straightforward in a bank as it is in software houses because architects uh, need to approve every technology before it goes into full development. Uh, so we had to choose a tech our technology wisely. First, uh, we started with uh, native, uh, our research with native applications, but this time with proper languages and by proper languages I mean Kotlin and Swift uh, with proper architecture um, with MVVM on Android, to be precise. Unfortunately, writing uh, native applications uh, at that time was still really hard, especially on Android platform. Uh, and uh, when something is hard, it means that you need to do a lot of hacks to make something work, and later it will, it will be bad, <laughs> because the maintaining will be again a big problem, especially on Android, like I said. Uh, even if it's uh, a promoted way by uh, Google and Apple, we thought that we should uh, keep looking and keep our research with different technologies stuck. So, a second approach that we chose to try uh, was a web wrapper way, uh, Ionic way. Um, Ionic is, a, the, I think, the, one of the best examples of this approach, web wrapper way. Uh, this path was easy, uh, easy to follow for developers uh, because creating UI and in HTML and CSS is really easy. I should say easy peasy lemon squeezy. Uh, and developing uh, logic is also easy because you can use uh, Angular with its TypeScript or if you are into JavaScript, you can use React or Vue. So you can say, Perfect, but no, uh, it isn't perfect because there is a big uh, cost or in the performance side uh, because applications are written uh, around web wrapper, for example, like I said, in Ionic, uh, require a lot of uh, memory. They use a lot of battery, and that's not the best way to start a new application with worse with not the best performance. Another approach that we tried uh, is Xamarin. Mm, I don't like this approach. Uh, when I say approach, I mean Xamarin, uh, because I don't like it, uh, this framework. I, in my opinion, it's a bad framework, but that's, that's just my opinion. Uh, and that's not that I don't like .NET, uh, Microsoft.NET, because I love .NET Core, I love the old .NET framework for writing web applications, but Xamarin is not uh, like the C sharp, like the beautiful C sharp and th that technology that Microsoft stands for. Uh, Xamarin likes to throw weird error during, uh, errors during compilation and solving those errors can take hours. Uh, also, Xamarin gives two ways to develop applications. Uh, the first one is Xamarin Forms. Uh, this uh, Xamarin Forms way makes writing beautiful user interface in my opinion, like I said before, impossible. It's impossible to create something that looks beautiful and works great with animations. And there's a second way, uh, which is uh, Xamarin native, but it requires writing two UIs for each platform. And then you have to uh, combine it together with, for example, MVVM cross library. And as again, that's another library, that's another layer. You have to use a lot of layers in that Xamarin when you work in Xamarin native. And it's a really problematic. Uh, and big applications are big and can be in some cases unstable. 
another approach, <laughs> React Native. We also tried that uh, and we really like it. It was a great experience for us. It worked quite well, but it was not perfect. You might ask why? Why it wasn't perfect? Because it wasn't a real React, or I should call it full React. React Native doesn't use uh, that uh, web stuff, which is HTML, CSN, and all those things. Uh, instead, it uses a native components layer, and it means that a lot of libraries doesn't support Xamarin, uh, React Native, I'm sorry, React Native. So we, we have, you have to write a lot of things on your own or look for smaller libraries. So it wasn't the best way. And then, then that moment, uh, when we were almost forced uh, to choose uh, native technologies, uh, we saw a Google I.O. 18, two years ago, and that was it. That was it. Flutter was medicine for our problems, but it was still in beta. And that was a problem with the Flutter. Uh, it was still in relatively early stage, because beta is not a full release. Uh, and I spent a lot of time uh, trying to convince our architects and above them, the people above them, uh, to choose Flutter for this application. And it worked. After our proof of concept, they agreed to that, and we started our development. Now we need a glass of water. Uh, that's the timeline, how long it took us. Uh, we started uh, planning uh, at almost the end of 2017, and we started our true uh, development uh, at November of 2018. Uh, through, by through development, I mean uh, the main repository was created and we started developing the full application in the Flutter. It wasn't the proof of concept, it was the full application we started developing. And we released our Flutter application in May of 2020. 2020. So it was not, it was pretty um, new application. It's still in 3.0.0, which is the first release. We didn't release a new version, but we are planning to release a new application. Okay, you already know the story behind the, this ING business mobile application, but what about mistakes that you can say, you can make in a, in a new technology? We knew that we cannot make mistakes in the architecture. We have to make uh, the source code as clean as possible and uh, make architecture as easy to follow as possible. Um, that was very important for us because we knew that uh, this application would be huge. Uh, and today I can say that the application is huge. It has got over 80 screens or pages. I can, depends on how you call it. It has got over 80 pages, individual pages, not sub pages, individuals, 80 pages and hundreds of our custom widgets, small widgets that are placed on the pages. So it's really, really big. Okay, but how did we made that architecture? It will be, whew, it might be quite long, but we uh, choose a block. A block is a the business logic controller. It's almost <laughs> like Redux, but not much. Uh, I mean, it's close. Uh, I know that some of you might not know this concept, so in short, I will try to how it works. A uh, block is a design pattern that helps to separate presentation layer from a business logic. Uh, in this pattern, we have some immutable state that cannot be changed, but you can copy that state with some different uh, fields. Mm. And also that state is uh, stored in a business logic controller uh, that also handles uh, the logic that is behind uh, all that page. Uh, and uh, the business logic controller uh, changes states based on the logic inside it uh, by events that come from the presentation layer, which is a user interface in this page. And that is quite complicated and can be counterintuitive because it introduces a lot of programming concepts like strings and React programming. But after some practice, in my opinion, it's uh, really great. It will help to remove all the logic from the user interface. 
And if you don't know this pattern, I highly recommend uh, checking out a YouTube channel, Google YouTube channel, about uh, blog, B-L-O-C, uh, because Google has a lot of great uh, videos about it. Okay, blog business logic controller is a great foundation, but it's a, just a foundation of our, our architecture. It's great on its own, but it's not enough. So, uh, we use uh, dependency injection to inject uh, a lot of services and repositories. I will talk about them in a minute. Uh, but we use uh, to inject a lot. Of, we use we inject a lot of code. Uh, to do that, we use get uh, underscore it library. Get it. Uh, it's a great library. It's a really great library. But uh, you still have to write a lot of boilerplate code. And uh, in big application, a lot of boilerplate code is a problem. Like I said, we have got uh, over 80 pages. So we thought we have to solve that problem. So we wrote our own locator. Mm. We had to write our own locator because uh, get it library doesn't support a lot of things like uh, other injection libraries in, like for example, Java, but it's not the uh, library fault. It's not the get it library fault. It's the Dart fault in the platter because it doesn't support reflection. So we wrote our relocator and solved our problem. How we did that? Uh, we used a, a great library, code underscore builder, and we are generating a lot of code with that library and uh, we do not repeat ourselves in the code. And as far as I know, it is the one of the best ways to emulate the JavaScript reflections and other languages reflections. And we are using this uh, code builder in really, really, really many things. I will talk about them later. Uh, it's a great tool, like I said. Mm, here's an example from the documentation that you can, for example, generate. You can generate almost anything. We are generating code in the locator. Mm, that is repetitive. We search for the code, uh, we search for the service the repositories, and we add them in the locator automatically. Mm, and that's how we solve that reflection problem. Okay, but uh, take a look at our architecture at higher level. Mm, here's a simplified diagram, but it pretty much shows everything uh, in our architecture that is important. So uh, let's take from the left side of uh, your screens. Uh, first of all, we have uh, we have our user interface presentation layer. Uh, that layer doesn't handle logic on its own. Instead, it, it is connected uh, to the block. Uh, and it's connected uh, with our custom uh, page that it uh, inherited from. It inherited from block page widget. Uh, and that class is our own custom class that handles uh, easy access to state, easy access to event. Um, it automatically disposed some elements, so it's a little, really great. Uh, and it removes that boilerplate code again, <laughs> because we do not have to write a lot of that. It uh, do that for us. Uh, and that page is connects automatically to the proper block um, and gets state from there. So we can set uh, elements in our UI from that state in the block. And UI uh, also can call events from the block. So it's typical block, but uh, it's are made with our custom block widget page. Our block doesn't handle is a lot of logic in map event to state function. We do not, we do not uh, um, place our logic there in the block because we, do not, we didn't want to make our block big, really, really big in state instead. Uh, we inject our logic into block uh, with, uh, with services and with our locator. Uh, one block can have many uh, services. And the service uh, handle the logic calculation, all of, the, all of those uh, calculation stuff, uh, but it doesn't handle communication with the server on its own. Instead, we have our own repository layer, which is another layer of abstraction, and the repository layer converts data transfer objects into our internal uh, smaller model objects uh, and the other way around uh, also so from model objects into our data transfer objects and also 
communicates with the server with our custom HTTP client server. You may ask, custom HTTP client server? Yes, <laughs> I said uh, that because uh, our repository uses that custom HTTP client server for communication. Uh, why did we do that? Why did we create a custom HTTP client implementation if Flutter already has its own uh, implementation for communicating with uh, using HTTP? So we wanted to make our communication at go as good as possible and make it as secure as possible. And you know, it's a bank. So our, when you transfer any data uh, in 99.9 point cases, it is really, really, really important data. So we have to protect it. Uh, that is why we implemented on the low level, our own implementation of communicating um, with the server and it protects us uh, from, I should say, most of the hacker attacks that I can imagine or any can imagine. Uh, for example, it protects us from man in the middle attacks. So if someone takes uh, someone's router, and so you have got a phone, you have got a router, and somewhere is our server. So if someone uh, hack um, takes control of the that router, internet connection, uh, he cannot uh, hack our data. It is protected against those attacks. If our client detects that, uh, it interrupts all the connection. So no data can be leaked uh, via, uh, with that communication. Uh, it detects much more uh, level of those hacks because it is very complex uh, because it for example someone may use some complex i don't know connection uh, so it might for some people be detected as false positive so we had to write a lot of that custom code to protect against um, false positive and in the same time to make it as secure on many levels as possible uh, and it works i can talk too much about against which attack it protects and how it is implemented uh, because uh, my <clears throat> my company doesn't allow me to talk about that, but uh, like I said, it protects, for example, against men in the middle attacks. <clears throat> okay, so I'm talking already for a long time. So one more interesting part of our custom implementation, and who is it? It's a code builder. Like I said. Uh, it's really worth mentioning many times because it's one of the best libraries that uh, exist in the platform, in my opinion. Because, for example, close your eyes, uh, if I can say that. And uh, I will ask you a question. Let's say you have 10 images. How do you handle them? Some of you probably will say, okay, I will create the class and I will store uh, cons uh, strings that will be passed to those images. Fair enough, that's a good solution. <clears throat> but if you have 50 of them, or you have 100 path to images, how do you manage those paths? Uh, in my opinion, you cannot manage those paths uh, manually. Um, and that's why we created our own asset generator tool that generates path to our tool and stores that uh, in the special classes. You can generate images fonts, certificates, anything. You can store almost anything uh, in that. And it, it, it works. <laughs> uh, for example, now you on your screens, you can see part of our images class that is automatically generated with our asset generator class using code builder. And as you can see, it works quite well. This code is fully readable, readable and it saves us a lot of time. So if you are writing a huge application. I highly recommend you writing a, a learning code builder and writing a lot of repetitive code in it. Okay, but did it work out? Did our application change to better? Yes, it changed. Uh, our user ratings uh, on iOS didn't change. It's still 4.5 uh, out of five, but on Android, uh, in a really short period of time, uh, we changed our score from 2.2 out of 5 to 2.5 out of 5. You might say, ah, that's not a big change, but please remember that we have got a lot of negative opinions from our old application. So uh, making change from a low score to high score will take 
some time, maybe a longer of time, we get a lot of uh, five stars for our application in the Google Play, but still we have got a lot of uh, negative opinions from our old application. And that's pretty much it. Um, if you ask some questions, I will answer them, those questions now. But if you would like to stay in touch, you can add me on LinkedIn and ask me some question. I don't know if I will be able to answer that question because like I said, uh, some of uh, elements may be secret due to our organization that I work, but I will try to do my best today and later to answer those questions. And that's pretty much it. Thank you All for right. your time.